वेलकम बैक टू द नेक्स्ट एपिसोड ऑफ द नेक्स्ट मार्केटिंग विद एच ए एज इन मी टूडे आई वॉन्ट टू वेलकम अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग पर्सन हु आई मेट अबाउट अ ईयर अगो एट अ कॉन्फ्रेंस एंड एट द फर्स्ट मीटिंग इट सेल्फ वी काइंड ऑफ स्ट्रक अ कॉर्ड हर नेम इज नैन्सी फेलन शी इज रेकोगनाइज एज अ सीनियर लीडर इन ओमनी चैनल मार्केटिंग एंड शी करेंटली वर्क एट इंडिजीन she would like to share some insights and draw some parallels how there are learnings from the consumer marketing which has helped progress the consumer advertising industry while the pharmaceutical industry because of the kind of regulations and not able to share successes and failures is not able to progress i am very excited to bring this next episode to you Thank you so much for joining the show. Next marketing with LJ. Delighted to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. I still remember our first time when we met was the the South Asian Pharmaceutical Council event, right? Uh, yeah. Last year, late last year, and mm-hmm. I must say I was kind of very admired with that initial conversation. And I think since then we have stayed in touch, exchanged conversation, exchanged knowledge and ideas. and i'm very happy to kind of invite you to the show here and share some wisdom with our viewers do you want to just introduce yourself share your background sure happy to and uh, hj it's it's a real pleasure to be with you and thank you so much for the uh, the invitation i also enjoyed our our discussion at sapc and we we keep it going on a regular basis so thank you uh so nancy feelin and uh, i currently head up the um Omni Channel Activation a business global business unit at Indigene and I've built my career in large pharma really driving change um across a variety of customer customers and markets and through my my focus and passion around being able to connect customers or people to the medications and the treatments that that we make as an industry I've really be, become um very focused on the power of data and, digi- and digital to democratize information and help connect people to the treatments that they need and along the journey i somehow figured out omni channel marketing and i'm still learning and still evolving um but really happy to be talking with you today i remember whichever pharma conference you go to either the main track is on omni channel or the main session is always on omni channel what would you say what really is omni channel That's a great question and you're right it is a it's a term that's very uh very um in vogue right now and when i talk to my uh, my networks you know i when you when you have those really safe conversations what i hear from everybody is we know we have to figure it out haven't have not really sure that we've got it exactly figured out we're on the way but we know we have to and you know what i think when i take a step back and i think about um omni channel you know i think back that you know the i think previously pre covid we ha- we lived in this world of like artificial distinctions where we would say that there's reps and then there's digital or there's multi channel and to me in this post covid world that i believe is here to stay omni channel is about the in, the in, intentional connection of data across all of these channels of of which rep is one and it's really about being able to um coordinate information data and experiences across all of the channels whether they are inside call centers whether they are in person experiences whether they are on ehr platforms whether they're on programmatic it's really about connecting all of those in service of a much improved relevant coordinated customer experience and so i suspect that Omni channel is going to continue to evolve, right? There's going to be new channels that come out, there's going to be new data sources that come out and our customers are always expecting more. And so I think that the um my network, I'm part of that network that feels that Omni channel is not exactly settled. I think that that's going to continue to be the case. Earlier it used to be multi channel, right? And and then we moved from multi channel to omni channel, right? And often at times, right? and ask what's the difference right so multi channel was an evolution from single channel you made few more channels and omni channel is all the channels right is that the case or there is something more to it? 
Ah, great question. So I, um, the way I think about multi-channel versus omni-channel is that when you, you, you're right, we started off with a single channel, then we moved to multi-channel and multi-channel is about constantly improving and optimizing within that channel. So getting really, really great at, at email and, and making sure that the experience across that channel, as an example, email is continuously improved, that you're testing, you're learning, you're optimizing, you're really getting great at it. But it's not about taking that horizontal view and also doing it across all of the different channels. And so, you know, to be able to move from multi-channel to omni-channel requires you to have um, a, um, an integrated data platform, requires you to have strength in analytics. And what I'm seeing um, that really makes or breaks success in those journeys is the ability of an organization to be able to make timely decisions. And that way you're actually getting the value of omnichannel. Because if you can't make timely decisions around what to do next with what the insight and the intelligence you're getting back, then don't even bother on the journey. That That's the piece that I think all too often people think that technology alone is going to solve it. And what I've found is that technology is a massive enabler, but it's not a substitute for um, intellect and for judgment and decision making. And those things have to come from people. Chat GPT channel? That's a great question. I think it's early days. I am very, very curious about um, and experimenting quite a lot with uh, with generative AI, with you know, chat GPT. Um, I think that it is it is too early to say. Um, I think that no question, it will absolutely have an impact. When I think about um, just a real life example, I was talking to um, talking to my my daughter. She's in college. She was taking a final exam. She had a question she couldn't figure out, and she went to Chat GPT and she said, "Explain this to me in a fourth grade level." And I was like, "Well, that's really fascinating. So could we take that same thing and apply it to science?" And instead of thinking about like a really complex MOA, say, could you explain this to me in a third grade level and then take that insight and use that to create really, really powerful content. So I think that there are um, real applications that are going to help us simplify and, and make things much more accessible. But then I also think that there will absolutely be some additional profound implications. It could be that there is a new channel. It could be that there's a fundamentally new way to create creative. Um, I think that it's very, very early days. What I do know is our industry tends to be um, a slow adopter. We tend to wait and um, understand when things are a little bit more settled. And so I suspect that there will be lots of opportunities for us to learn and be curious from potentially outside industry before it becomes very prominent within industry. Conversation on this subject, right? And less action. Like some of the biggest roadblocks in making this happen. Because I know, I think every company has intent to do this, but I don't see great success stories yet. Yeah, you know, I think that's um that's an interesting an interesting question. Yeah, there you know, talking always starts uh action always uh always lags. I think that that's an, an it's an important point that you're that you're making. I do think that companies are really being very intentional about building some of their own models, some of their own intelligence and for that reason it's proprietary and they're unlikely to go out and very broadly communicate what they're doing i do think that the there is a bit of a watch out and i'm going to cite the um the most uh, recent viva data which i thought was very interesting and it talked about the shifts that we're seeing from a physician perspective and it talked about how physicians are still seeing seeing reps but that physicians are limiting to only three companies that they will see. And so what I take away from that is that if you're one of those companies that is a that the doctor won't see, you may mistakenly think that that doctor is a no see doctor. And so your your models and the 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 capabilities that you're building are based off of a bias that's wrong that that doctor is no see. Whereas if you're one of the three companies the doctor will see, you're you're going to you're going to treat them very very differently. And so I think that from a a machine learning perspective while it's important to 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 build things internally, 
You've got to go external and look at other data sources and not just limit yourself to, to your own view. You've really got to have that diversity of data and perspective so that your models are actually going to be useful. And so I think that it's early days and companies are doing a lot of um, really interesting work, but I don't think it's yet something that people are ready to go publish in HBR that they've solved it. Data is always kind of one of the big conversations, right? When it is about pharma and data security, data uh, privacy, right? And and of uh, uh, different teams, uh, they kind of hesitate to share data within the same company as well. So I think bringing that data together and creation of those like models which can actually power a great omnichannel experience, right, is definitely, I think, one of the roadblocks. Like, do we have any any ideas on how we could potentially like move it forward? How like we can't solve it overnight, but how could we make some progress there? So I, you know, I I think you're you're spot on in terms of like the data piece and the data sharing piece being um a key, a key, I, maybe not roadblock, but it's a it's a congestion point. It's definitely a congestion point. And you know, I think Forrester um, you know, has has did some really interesting um analysis around, you know, some of the different components or drivers of quality data. And so I think that from an industry and a thought leadership perspective, I think that there are things that we can do. So so, um, you know, the, the seven dimensions are around like timeliness, you know, so what can we do to make sure that our data is really timely and makes it more actionable? Because one of the things I hear is, you know, it's stale data. Is it really recent, et cetera? So thinking about, you know, as a provider, as a partner, how can we get that data very, very actionable so that it feeds the models and that it, it, it reduces that barrier? Also hearing things about like completeness. So having completeness of data is really, really important and not having those those spots. The, the transparency in terms of, you know, what it is that you're actually doing, you know, understanding those impressions and things like that. So there's a lot of dimensions that go into data that if you have have some gaps in your data, you're going to have some question marks about the reliability and then the ability to build models off of that. So I think we can, we really need to focus on doing, um, being great stewards of the data and then also fostering like you're doing, fostering opportunities for people to safely um, start to talk about what they're doing and how they're thinking about things and building um, forums for sharing and really driving, I think, um, better understanding of what is possible and um, celebrating when we have some successes and also sharing when we have some um, some challenges and you know, seeking some some uh, other other perspectives. I remember very early in my career, I was um, invited out to the Google uh, Googleplex. This was like early two thousands, and I'll just share this because it completely changed my perspective on things. And so, um, I was at the visitor plex, so it was clearly you know a bunch of non Google people. And I'll never forget, I um I went to the ladies room and I closed the door and there they had on the back and I checked it, every single bathroom stall door had the same thing. And it was the Google's problem of the week. And they were describing an algorithm and a challenge that they had and they couldn't solve it. And they literally said, if you can help us solve it, here's an email, send us your solution. And I never forgot that because I thought, well, that's just really interesting because here's, you know, Google, like the huge, huge, organization, absolute thought leaders, they're intentionally going to the building where visitors go and asking for help. And what an interesting dynamic, because in pharma, we would never do that. We would never say, I need help. I can't figure this out. And so I think to your point, um, you know, some of the roadblocks are around data, but I think some of the roadblocks are also, um, we don't have a tendency to open up and say, I'm struggling on this. I'm struggling on that. Right now, for example, you know, the, the challenges we're facing around what is that, that new model in this post-COVID world and how, how will we engage physicians? I don't think there's a lot of, you know, I'm a little stumped by this. What are your thoughts? And kind of like industry-wide hackathons, if you will. So I just put that out there to say, I do think things like what you're doing right now, where you're actively having a conversation are very, very helpful and will give people encouragement. But I do think there's more that we could do. I'd be curious your perspective on, uh, I know you're supposed to be talking to me, but I'm going to talk right back at you. I always appreciate your thought leadership, what you think we should be doing to help enable more adoption and moving from talk to doing. Data is 
is the the problem area right because that is something which can stitch everything together and and that data right has been the topic of conversation right and i often try to solve any problem using the five wise right and and i tried doing that like here also and my assessment was like what are we really being protective of right like, what data is it like, is it uh, uh, is it the prescription data right which is available by so many data providers right we can buy mm-hmm. from it like what are we protecting is it the the call data right of of the sales reps right and what is call data right it's just an activity data right there is nothing more than that which is being protected right now right so like i i dissected like all these different sources of data right and realize that what you are protecting is actually available right it is there is only maybe a portion part of data which is not available anywhere else but 95% of the data is available in public domain already right so i feel it is just opening up to maybe i think keep your data protected right let it continue be a conversation how do we open up eventually right but use external data right create mm-hmm. models using external data which would raise less brows and develop models because and and i think see in us we are at a very advantageous position because of a single identity of every physician right npi all yes. the data that is available ties together to npi this is a very unique and advantageous position because outside of us it does not exist right so i believe if the only channel case study will emerge it will emerge from us I completely agree. I absolutely agree. I do think having an external view is really, really critical. And I know, you know, some of the things that we've been able to do, and again, because of the specificity and the the data privacy rules that we have in the U.S., we have more flexibility than we do outside the U.S. Some of the things that we've been able to do is we've been able to create models using um, proprietary digital affinity and market access affinity. And we've been able to collaborate with companies to help them think very differently about how you go to market, right? Because to your point, this data is it's out there we know the doctors are what they prescribe is publicly available data so it's not really proprietary i think what's proprietary or what people are holding on to is the choices that they're making in terms of how they go to market and what those drivers are like what are the key key drivers i think one of the things that we've had a lot of success with is helping people think a little bit differently about how to go to market and i think historically it's been um you know you lead with the rep model when you're thinking about hcps and then you layer on whether it's EHR, it's um, you know some sort of omni-channel, some sort of digital, some sort of something else, but you lead with the rep. And what we're starting to see and where we're having some really good success with our models is helping companies think about it more from a customer first view. So if you really understand your customer, there are some customers that absolutely want to see and only have face-to-face interactions. And then there's a whole other group of, of customers, physicians, and um, prescribers that don't, or they can't because they're owned by an institution and the institution has no C policies, or they prefer to do it on their own time. And so being able to, to partner with companies and create these models where you can actually instead think about leading with a digital first go-to-market model and then reach these you know key customers in a way that they prefer to be reached and really support them on their journeys. That's incredibly exciting, but that's only possible if you go, as you say, and build models using external data sources. If you only rely on your own internal data sources and your own internal models, you will have a a limited view. The future is to think very differently and take a more democratized, open open approach to how you build your models and how you source it from data. Funniest thing that you have heard in Omnichannel. Funniest thing that I've heard in Omnichannel. Um, I, that's, Geez, that is a that's a that's a question that comes out of comes out of nowhere. I'd say the funniest um the funniest thing I've heard in uh in Omni Channel is that uh you know it can't be done or that we're going to wait until we have everything done to to get started. And so I'm you know I I and I to that I'd be like, you know, that's that's actually there's no such thing as perfection. So if you're waiting to have everything perfect to get done, it's never gonna happen. And I would say, you know, to the people that are like, it can't be done. 
Well, there's lots of, you know, lots of reasons why you could, you know, why you should get started. And the to me, the power of Omnichannel is that it can give you um, immediate customer feedback and you can start to get pro you, progress over perfection is really how you need to think about it. You will never be in a world where all of your data is perfect all of your models are perfect and all of your customers do exactly what you predict they're going to do from a channel perspective. So the sooner you start figuring out how to navigate and how to be successful and where you need to really focus, the sooner you are going to build those skills and have that success. Every day you delay is a day that is a missed opportunity. Um, but I I haven't yet heard somebody say something that about Omnichannel that I found uh, uh, worthy of a, a comic, uh, a, a comedian. So I'll, I'll keep my years open for that that was a good that was a tough question I, i'm rarely stumped but you did it hj how about you i might have heard right, that uh, especially from this industry where we belong right that there is always a need that we want to do something innovative but can you get me a case study for that Yes. Oh, that's that's one of my favorites. It's brand planning season and we need we need something innovative. And so you, you know, but then they want to have the data case behind it, which I can appreciate because, you know, when you're sitting in, I've sat in those seats and when you're going through tough budget trade-offs and things like that, you know, there's a there's a desire to have really, really strong data for it. Um, and so I would say that if you've got you know data around something, perhaps it's not so innovative. Um, if it's if it's already got the data and the case is already published, so I think that you know this mindset of having a hypothesis, doing something, testing it, learning, and then optimizing—that's really the mindset that we need of the future. And you know, certainly, it doesn't mean that you don't have data to back things up. But if you are expecting to have data and a robust case for every single thing that you do, that's different you're not going to be successful. So I think embracing a mindset of like test, learn, and optimize. And that's the beauty of Omnichannel. You will get data back very, very quickly. And you'll know if you're heading in the right direction or if you're not. And the, the thing is, again, if you can be those people that make decisions quickly, you can make a decision to make a change and you can see it a, an almost immediate shift in terms of the market response. Uh, just last one, your, your message that you would like to give to young pharma marketers. My message is that the um, it is I think it is a privilege, an absolute privilege, to be part of pharma because the work that we do is really, really important. The medications can fundamentally change somebody's life, and don't lose sight of that. So when you are getting frustrated that something may be taking a little bit longer and you know to get get live or whatever, I would say draw your draw your um, your dedication and your passion from the the larger mission that we do and focus on progress over perfection. Like truly just get started. You will never be perfect. It will never be flawless, but get started today and know that there are lots of people that um, are here to help you and support you. And um, that's the opportunity that we have in this industry is to find a, a smarter, better way to connect the products that are really, that can truly be transformational to the people that need them when they need them and um, help improve better outcomes. I think that to me is why, why I got into this industry in the first place. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thank you, HJ. Total pleasure. How do you see this data getting misused? I just not using it. I mean, in real simple terms, non it's all non, -use. non -use. It's It's almost, you know, in some ways you go, I'd love to have misuse. At least it would inform a dialogue. And it would be used. Yeah, yeah, you would have a conversation with your client. But uh, I find myself following up with clients going, hey, you get this physician level data. I give it to you weekly or monthly. Can I feed this to you? And sometimes weeks pass by and you're thinking, am I really begging this client to have this type of data.